I, and they hate it. So I'm in a relationship. I'm in a relationship right now with someone I've known for six years. He always had a boyfriend. I always had a girlfriend. Finally, we were both single, and it's work. It's working really well, and you know, she, she wants her song, right? <laughs> of course. But I'm like, I don't write when I'm happy. You know, I can't. You know, like do something shitty to me and break up with me out of nowhere, then you'll get like 10, you know? <laughs> you were never mine, it was just my turn At least this time I was quick to learn That you can't hold on Welcome to The Marinade, a free-flowing conversation about the creative process with creative people. Each episode, we welcome musicians, actors, comedians, authors, visual artists, filmmakers, anyone who creates art to talk about how and why we make stuff. This is episode 174, and our guest is Chris Robeson. After writing a thousand songs and recording several albums in solitude, Chris Robeson has finally released his debut album, Euphoraphobia, and it is outstanding. I love when a record has one foot in the world of singer-songwriters and the other planted among indie rock giants. That's what Euphoraphobia does. My conversation with Chris is about overcoming mental blocks, processing tragedy and fear, the craft of songwriting, and so much more. Everyone, it is my great honor to bring you my conversation with Chris Robeson. There's an exit sign nearly every mile. At least I held you for a while. At least I you. held I you for a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean. There we go. There's also a air purifier on. I think that might have been contributing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm in Florida and it's fucking 10,000 degrees right now. I'm I'm in Florida, it's 10,000 degrees right now, and I have to when I turn it off, I'm always like, at least I'm getting to talk to cool people because <laughs> it gets it gets sweltering in here. But man, this thing is so great, and your story seems fascinating to me. I've done done my research and um, mm-hmm. you know listened to interviews with you, and I'm just fascinated by how you got to this point. Um, so. Before we do that, though, like, I kind of want to, as a jumping off point, dive right into the record, if that's all right. I would love that. Thank you. Uh, um, Because there's a couple of songs, as I mentioned, that that really speak to me. The the first one um, that hit me is Held You. Um, I'm just I'm going through my second breakup in nine months. And Mm. um, one of them was a 10 year partnership. And the other one was this whirlwind romance. I was deeply in love with this woman. And. And, uh, and so like every day is just, you know, get up, put one foot in front of the other, you know, trying to, trying to, to get through the day. Like that's kind of the, the space I'm in right now. And this song really helped me. It helped me to think about all of the good things. It helped me to go back to like the appreciation for, you know, those, I was in a relationship with those people for a reason. Right. And this song helped me to understand it. So I wonder if you could speak about that particular tune that's meant so much to me lately. Thank you for saying that. Um, So my experience, the song was written about the latter of your two scenarios. It was the whirlwind uh, romance. It was a summer kind of fling. I met this girl, Lexi Kiddo, and uh, she was a songwriter. I met her at this, uh, the Austin Songwriters Group at a song doctor thing where you bring songs and it's critiqued and we took a liking to each other and uh she was really big in my uh, my decision to start writing full time because mm. i had all these song snippets and all these like little bastard children you know these mm-hmm. little these little monsters and she actually went through every one of them with me and like gave them a thumbs up or thumbs down she was like wow. but she was so interested just to go through it and it's like some i put a bunch of pieces of gum underneath the table and she was like flipping it over and like mm, look at that one look at that you know that one's good <laughs> That's how it felt, but uh, wow. so but so I, I basically lived at her her parents' house for a summer, and I just kind of like stayed. With, there was like this annex of the house, and we stayed up there, and all we did was write, um, amongst other things. But yeah, she was, she, and so it was one of those relationships. It wasn't like really a, a officially boyfriend girlfriend kind of that thing, but there was definitely love and some romance there. And uh, when it ended, you know, 
it was it was really tough and you know but we it was amicable breakup and so I wrote that song for her and she and she liked it a lot so I was mostly just trying to you know leave with romance the way we entered with romance um, and so yeah that, that was uh, it's one of the real it's one of the songs on the record that I actually sing with my real voice you know like oh that's real. <laughs> Okay, so that's super interesting. You mean, you mean like your internal voice, or you mean like your sonically your voice? Sonically, not okay. trying to. Yeah. So that's something that I'm really curious about because you go a lot of different places sonically on this record with your voice, and I'm curious about those choices. Like, is it each song needs something different? Is it a feel thing? I'm curious about that because that definitely stood out to me that sonically you, you're it sounds different on on different songs it's part of the writing process when i'm writing i usually the character exists before the lyric does mm. um because i like to do the the gibberish thing like i sing in tongues that's how i find the song kind of mm -hmm. and so usually the character and the phrasing and even the rhyme scheme kind of exists before the lyric does mm. so and then I, I just try to honor the original spirit of the song most of the time. Sometimes they morph, but uh, usually whatever thing is coming out of me when it's created, I try to... Because it kind of guides the concept of the song. Even the, my voice, I'm not like doing crazy Kermit the Frog shit, but there, there, there's subtle differences in the voices, and, and, I, and I feel the different character that's singing it, and so I try to write from that person's perspective, whoever they are. And, uh, so yeah, usually I commit to... Uh, the way it was originally intended, sometimes I have to change it in the studio if it's not working. But where do those yeah. where do those characters come from? I don't know. I like to do voices um, in general. I was like a theater kid, mm -hmm. but I don't know. You're just kind of experimenting when you're writing, you know. Okay. So what whatever comes out in the moment, it, it, usually the groove or the rhythm of the lyric or the you know the 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 character the, the song has a character and, and i try to make the the voice fit it usually okay that makes sense i okay so let's get to what that process looks like then so that sounds um a little more unique than a lot of folks that i that i talk to a lot of folks do do the kind of gibberish thing that's a fairly normal technique but what is like from start to finish what does that process look like for you in writing because one of the fascinating bits about this whole process is just how many songs you've written albums you've been sitting on you've been doing this a long time and you've got a lot of stuff so there's a lot of process that you've mm -hmm. been through and so i'm curious what that process looked like looks like and how much it may have evolved over time well yeah when, when i first started writing i was around 13 and i was writing the worst little mutated songs <laughs> I, my favorite band from a young age was ween and so it's, it's part of the influence is just like let let the song be whatever it wants to be never make it sound like you because there is no me like i'm never trying to you know sit down or write something um and so yeah you're just like anything goes basically and uh so for a while it was a lot of experimentation a really a lot of really bad bad songs for about five years um, but I started, once I started getting better at structure, song structure, that's, that's kind of when everything kind of fell into place. And I feel like the most important part when I'm writing is I'm just, you know, trying to hammer something out. If something feels good, if something's fun to play, that's usually fun to listen to. Mm. And, uh, and so once I get that kind of like the, the idea of how the song feels, where the changes occur, uh, the concept starts forming. Once there's a concept, like who's the character and what are we saying here? Then it just bam, 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 bam. Everything usually falls into place. Wow. Okay. So the structure, is that something that you're learning? You mentioned kind of the songwriting um, sort of groups and that kind of thing. Like, mm. are, is that something you're learning from workshopping with other people? Is that something you're learning from process of elimination? Where does that understanding of structure come from, especially as, as a young songwriter? A lot of it comes from just listening to music I, I love, you know, Beatles, um, they have a lot of interesting structures. Uh, it, it's about toying with structure, trying to break it just enough to where it still works. Or even like the shins. Like, 
he's really great at just like Mercer's really great at like starting a song almost like in media res. Like you're already in the middle of the action. Like, it's like, oh, this is the first verse. You just started singing to me, and then he just like transitions between parts, uh, and you never know what you're expecting. So there's a lot of different things you can do with structure. It's about playing around, trying to break some rules, uh, but still have it seem cohesive. Um, but definitely working these songwriters groups has been has been useful to me. It's also been useful to how much I've written because of the song doctor thing I was talking about. It's every Monday and Thursday, and so what I started doing. There's a lot of people who are nervous in there because, you know, people, they've never been critiqued before. Um, and, you know, and they're, they're, they're babies. They don't want them to be torn apart. So I started, on purpose, writing a song two hours before Song Doctor starts. So I write, start writing at 5 p.m. and just trying to get something that makes sense in that two-hour period just so I could show them. Be like, look, don't be, don't be married to your ideas. Everything is, is malleable. But that... What ended up happening was I started getting pretty good at that, and uh, being able to write some of the two-hour songs ended up on the record. You know? Oh wow! Okay, so let's get that gets that leads us to the fact that you had written so much and hadn't released it. At, mm -hmm. Like, can you talk? I know you've said a lot about it, but I'm fascinated by that, and and, and I think I'm fascinated by it from my own perspective, and I'm only speaking for me here. I haven't written thousands of songs, but I've got a record's worth of songs that I that I'm proud of, and I've only recently started to really confront my imposter syndrome about it. And part of that for me is that I'm surrounded. I have almost all my friends are musicians and songwriters, mm -hmm. and so I'm surrounded by all these people who are objectively better than me, right? Mm -hmm. Like they just are. I, that's not me trying to be humble or something. They're just better than me, and so. Now, of course, they're my friends, so they encourage me to get out there and play. And then I've that I have been playing publicly more, and and it has been well received. And so I'm starting to work through that imposter syndrome. But I'm wondering if that's the same kind of thing for you, and like what that process looked like going from I'm sitting on a thousand songs to I've made this incredible record that people are raving about. Uh, part of it was imposter syndrome for a while. I don't think it's the biggest part because I do believe. In my songs, it, it's been a psychological barrier for me, and it feels so nice to have released. Let me tell you how good it, like, it feels. Awesome! So good to get the monkey off my back Hell because yeah. I, I don't know. It's like the first band aid rip. Like when I was younger, and I was making these these kind of weirder, experimental, vulgar crap. Like these songs, I was putting them on YouTube without a care in the world. I was just sharing them freely. But once I, I you know started going to a professional studio, I started getting a little bit better at writing. Now, if I release, I'm admitting to the world that I care about this thing, right? Right. And you're you're opening yourself. If you if you don't care about the feedback, because like I could be like, oh, clearly it's a joke, or obviously it's bad. That's the point. But now I'm like, no, no, I think it's good, and I want you to think it's good. And so that was part of the psychological barrier, but also, it's a branding issue, uh, because I have so many different types of songs and different types of characters. Like this record steers towards the dark and the intense, emotionally intense. Mm -hmm. And so this worked, at, it, these songs worked, and I kind of wanted to put that part of myself forward first because I always had this fear of being perceived as a clown because I have a lot of funny songs and I have a lot of, lot of kind of more lighthearted uh, things. And it was just deciding, I don't know, I put too much thought into it. Like, obviously we care what other people think about, but eventually I was just like, D dude, I'm 37. I got to, what am I doing, you know? Well, it sounds like that decision, though, there there seems to be a whole lot that wrapped up in it, too. Like, more than just I'm 37 and what am I doing? Like, can you take us through that those that moment deciding, like, all right, I got to really get my shit together when it comes to putting this out? Honestly, a lot of my friends started getting annoyed. They kept telling me to release, like, the last five years. What are you going to put your stuff out? Then I, then I recorded the first record with Gabe Rhodes, and I never put that out. That was, that was recorded four years ago and uh i don't know covid was hard a lot of you know i have issues with um depression and substance abuse anxiety and so sometimes i procrastinate and i stall and it's just easy to self-delude about it i guess mm -hmm. and uh and i think the big thing was uh you know adam dawson who you're aware um I hired a, hired a publicist, and I, I told myself, like, I'm, I'm never going to do this unless I actually put something behind it. So I, I mm. paid someone to help promote me a little bit. 
And because that way, it's not just me that's relying on me. There's someone else who is has an expectation. So that helped a little bit as well. Dude, that's the biggest thing about this uh, this most recent breakup. For uh, almost 11 years, I had somebody, and I was accountable to them. One of the biggest things about getting up and making stuff, going to work every day. I'm a middle school teacher, so I got a pretty demanding job. Uh, I take my creative work very seriously. Uh, my songwriting is a hobby, but it's a serious hobby. This podcast means a lot to me. I have another podcast. Like I got a lot of shit going on. And the biggest thing about it is like finding people to be accountable to because if it's just me, I'll usually show up for me. Like yeah. I'll, I'd say like 80% of the time I show up for me, but there's a 20% chance that I'm not going to show up for me. And that gap I'm trying to close as I learn to be alone. It's a really interesting dynamic mm -hmm. that I did not expect. You know, I didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so you hire the publicist. You had a great one, by the way. That's how right. it ended up in my hands. He's a good dude. Yeah. It, yeah, he's a good dude, and he's. I love. He always sends me CDs, and that's the way I. I love prefer to consume it. Right. I like to put it in the car. I like to drive around with it. I like to have the physical copy. Um, everything about this physical copy is beautiful. Um, and Thank you. yeah, I like the whole bit. And, um, you hire somebody and my, I guess my question now is like, where do you go from here? Are you touring this record? Are you, that's one thing that I need to get better at. Like I love writing and recording being in the studio is my favorite place. As far as playing live, I've never been in a band. Everyone in this record is, you know, hired studio musicians. Never been in a band. It's a little bit more out of my comfort zone. People, when people see me play, they're always like, Chris, you're a great performer. What are you worried about? I, you know, I guess the booking, do, doing the whole thing, that's another little barrier i got to get over, like uh, admitting publicly that I think I'm good enough for you to come to my show, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I need to play live more. I, get, I need to get more comfortable with it. I need to get more comfortable playing with a band. It's something I actually really want to do. It's, it's not that I... I um, but I'm mostly playing a like, singer-songwriter hovels like New World Deli here in town. And I got some winery shows, but I, I I don't have a show like a consistent you know place that I play. So I would love to do that. As far as uh, music, what comes next? It feels nice that we have this baseline now, right? I got my first record out, so I can't use that as an excuse anymore. Now it's nice because I can just start putting stuff out whenever I want. It's the most liberating thing I think that I feel from finally releasing. Oh, I'm stoked for you. So what about the ones that you've had shelved? Like, are those, yeah, they'll be very soon here. And I, I, I'm fighting with the, uh, the urge to just put it all out right now. Like <laughs> after the first one, just, just put a record out every month for like a year. And then we're like, okay, we're, we're, cu we're caught up. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's awesome. That's exciting. Especially after having, having spent so much time with this. Yeah. Um, you know, I listened to this, I went on a big road trip. The first time I listened to this was coming back from, uh, from, uh, I'm trying to think when he sent this to me. I'm almost positive. This is when I was listening to it. Cause I, I was coming back from, from, uh, Kentucky or I'm originally from, um, I, I like got back to my roots and I went back to see my family and friends and like where, uh, I was born, where my mom was born, where my dad was born. And then I went to, uh, Laurel Cove festival. I went to Bonnaroo and then on the way back, I was like cycling through all the CDs that Adam gave me, right? Yeah. So I'm just like, you know, some of them eh, don't hit for me. So I just, you know, I'll give them a listen. It doesn't hit for me. This one grabbed me immediately. And I, I was like, all right, I got to talk to this guy. Um, I was but, worried about it too, because I, I kind of chose the, the first two songs are kind of the, the weirder ones on the record. Yeah. So I was like, the, it's a weirder voice on both of them. So I was like, well, if someone passes this filter well, then they're going to be in, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's one of the things that I love about it is that there's a lot of elements of sort of what you might expect from um, a lot of Americana or singer songwriter -y kind of stuff, but it's also got that element of indie rock kind of weirdness that I really gravitate toward. And I'm constantly mm -hmm. trying to find, like, marry those, those worlds. You mentioned the Shins earlier. I had this whole period. I'm a, slightly older than you. I'm 43. Mm -hmm. And, like, I had this whole period in the, you know, early – 2000s where i was just crazy about like all kinds of indie rock spoon and um and uh and and the shins and wilco and all this Lo stuff right Lo lonesome crowded west was kind of my 
my my favorite <laughs> yes all that stuff right and it's like yeah. and but i also love waylon jennings and i love all the stuff that people uh you know the new sturgill record and john moreland and all this kind of singer songwritery stuff towns i can go on and on yeah. But those those worlds are kind of I feel like I'm constantly straddling those two worlds. And right. that's what I feel like. There's a lot of I love that you say here. that because I've, I've told many people my goal is to to merge Chris Christopherson and Ween. As, <laughs> Hell yeah, as, man. As, as, as challenging as that may be, that that kind of is the goal. Because uh, we I love like the, the sonic atmospheres they create. Every song sounds like a different genre. Every song is a different voice, different character to it. And then Chris Christopherson is like, I think, one of the best writers who's ever lived. Yeah. But so Wayne doesn't focus on like lyrical content normally. It's more about like, you know, soundscape. So if you could take a, a well written song and also kind of fuck it up just a little bit, do you know what I mean? Yes. Put, put, put some scars on it. Yes. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. And that and that's what I think what grabbed me about this record from the beginning is that you did that. I mean, just that's what grabbed me about it from the beginning. So yeah, you're right. The first two are kind of the weirder ones, but I was I was ready. I was I was in for that ride immediately. Um, and then it just keeps giving and giving the other song that I wanted to talk to you about that mm -hmm. has meant a lot to me. And especially today, for whatever reason, I re-listened today uh, a couple of times and feel the good things too hit me differently today than it has. I'm not sure why. I don't know what I was dealing with or needed to hear mm -hmm. in it, but it's one of my, it's one of the standouts for me. One of my favorite songs on the record. Can you talk about that particular song as well? Yeah, thank you. That that one is kind of the crux of the concept of the record, right? It's a uh, fear of happiness, and it, it's kind of the record kind of end, ends on a sour note. There's like three suicide songs back to back to back, you know. Mm -hmm. And the beginning songs are kind of like you know stating the where where your head's at, and then kind of wandering, and then it gets a little bit sad. But yeah. I wrote that for myself. It's a self-help song, you know. I know what you're going through, boy. I know how dark it can get. Um, I had, you know, a lot of people close to me commit suicide during COVID, mm. and so it, it was a self-help song for me, but also kind of like what I wish I could have told, you know, been there for my friends who, who did that, you know. Um, don't give up. Uh, it's so easy to to get addicted to your emotional states, you know. Like, even if depression feels shitty, even if it sucks being sad, sometimes because it, it's comfortable, it's like an easier, like, little kind of um, brain rut to fall back into. Like, I know it's going to feel bad, but at least it's familiar. Yep. Uh, and so, I feel the good things, too. It's just like, well, well, if something good happens to you, instead of waiting for the other shoe to fall, actually just sit with that emotion, too. Why, you feel all the bad things so strongly. Why won't you allow yourself just smile and be happy whenever something good is happening instead of just try you know it's like being bad at taking compliments which i'm also really bad at like someone mm -hmm. says something nice i try to like shrug it off or make some self-deprecating joke no no just yep. like thank you receive it you know yeah <laughs> i mean every, I'm, everything you're saying <laughs> i am relating to everything you're saying which makes sense that i connected with the record so much because yeah that um if you have you know depressive or anxious um issues as i do um there's a lot of you get used to certain states you do and while you also intellectually want to get out of it right and you you know you need to get out of it and you need to get to a place where you're celebrating the positives more i think that it this song woke me up to the fact that I've got so many great things going on in my life right now. Like my life is really fucking good actually. Mm -hmm. Um, in it's hard to, to put those moments at the forefront when you're, when you're feeling so heartbroken, you know, and you're mm -hmm. feeling so down in so many ways, mm -hmm. but that's the beauty of a, of a song like this is that it today snapped me out of things and made me go like, buddy, Think about this laundry list of things that are that you're so fortunate for and like how great your life is and your friends and your family and your dogs and your health and like all this shit, man. Like yeah. my job is awesome. This podcast is great. Like it's I can go on and on, right? Yeah. Writing like better than yeah. that. Hedonic adaptation, right? So it, you always adjust to a new normal. So things start going well for you consistently. Well, then – you know, you, you your brain balances out, and that's just normal. And so it's easy to, 
to not appreciate or be grateful for good things because now you're just used to feeling them. Um, yeah. And also, yeah. on the on the inverse, if you have a really, really shitty life, you put yourself in like voluntary discomfort. And you get pretty used to that. You can you can handle you know living like a pauper uh, after you've gotten used to it. Yeah. There's a lot of freedom in that. Right. Well, okay, that's an inter- interesting point that you just made because I know in, in my research I heard that you were an engineer and you quit that job and saved up some money and quit that job. And well, you, you, you did do some research. <laughs> committed yourself to kind of going full time into this art. Like, can you talk? That's not an easy decision, man. And all of us want to do it. Those of us who make stuff, right? And we talk mm-hmm. about that on this show all the time. Is like, how do you know when you're ready to do it? How do you know when you're ready to go full in? Can you talk about your thought process there and like how you how you came to that place and how you pulled it off? Yeah, so I graduated with my engineering degree when I was 28. I had a long go of it. Like I couldn't get into school. I couldn't afford it. Um, I couldn't get loans until I was 24. It was this whole victim complex, woe is me story behind all this. I got over the bitterness eventually, but... I finally graduated the engineering degree from UT and I was feeling good about myself, but that year I I collapsed playing uh, kickball with atrial fibrillation, which is a heart condition, it's like an arrhythmia. Usually happens to people in their 60s and 70s, but I was 28 years old. Uh, So that was kind of like mortality flashing its lights in my face and then I, 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 I quit drinking and smoking for four years obviously you see me doing both right now but i was (laughs) so so sober for four (laughs) years um and then that's when i kind of put my life together and i started saving all my money and at that point i was kind of like you know i just gotten out of a breakup my heart uh failed me then the the oil market crashed and so like even the, the degree that i spent 10 years finally trying to get to prove to others that I was whatever smart or prestigious like I wasn't doing that for myself like I was it was good Mm. I was good at it I'm good at math and science or whatever so but I never wanted to be an engineer I was just doing it to prove something to other people you know and no one ended up caring when I got it no one's like like, oh congratulations son or whatever dude it's such an important lesson I that's why I got a law degree I have a law degree that I got just to just to be like fuck you guys I can do it and mm-hmm. that's a terrible reason. But mm-hmm. anybody listening, it's a terrible reason to go get a degree of any kind. I guess when you're growing up with uh, two brothers and you're all very competitive and you you have withholding parents, <laughs> you, <laughs> there's this there's other yeah, there's like goals in mind where you're trying to like you know win some kind of race. But yeah, so that happened, and then the market crashed, and then I was stuck stuck without a job, fucked up heart, break up. And then I, I found these really useful blogs. Uh, this one I read every day, Raptitude, uh, by David Kane. It's a great blog. Uh, it's about mindfulness and, you know, being present and all that kind of, you know, woo-woo stuff. And then Mr. Money Mustache is this uh, early retirement blog. This guy retired at 30. And he's a great way of writing. He's hilarious. So I read, the, I read, I consumed basically 400 of those blog posts in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Not stop reading it. And then I ended up getting a job in, uh, in tech and real estate. And I just saved, yeah, saved 75% of my money for a long time because I realized the one, only thing that's scarce these days is, is, your, uh, is your time and mm-hmm. your liberty, right? So I'll, I never really cared about getting a fancy house and car. So I was like, well, I'm going to use my money uh, to give myself time. So I live really cheap. My rent's 400 bucks in Austin. This room what? here. I moved into a dining room. It didn't have a door on it. I had to make a sliding door. Um, yeah, Holy real cheap. Shit. My total bills every month, if you take away alcohol and cigarettes, <laughs> like eight <laughs> like eight hundred bucks a month or something. So what? I, tr- I tr- <laughs> yeah, and I saw so I was saving all my money as an engineer, and then I I just found I was like I can live for like five years without working, and that was and that's the moment I pulled the ripcord and I just been dedicating myself to to writing every day and, uh, all, but you could also become a slave to your own freedom. And, yeah. and, uh, there's a little bit of that, you know, like your time becomes less valuable you have when you have a lot of it, just like anything. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I haven't been like, yeah, I told myself I'm going to stop working. I'm going to u- make music my full-time job. Well, it's like part-time, you know, I yeah. write a lot, but the other time, the rest of the time I'm still kind of screwing around. But I, I run into that. I think about that a lot when I think about, um, 
trying to dedicate myself to my art full time. I'm not in a, I'm not even close to that position right now, but I do have summers off because I'm a teacher and I have Christmas off and I have spring break. And so I have a lot of time that I can write, that I can make things that I can podcast. And so I, I do, I get up and I treat it like a full-time job, but by 11, I've done so much shit. <laughs> like in, on a, on a July day by 11 o'clock in the morning, Mm. I've already like prepared for two podcasts, maybe recorded one. I've cleaned the house. I, you know, there's just so much that you can do when you have that time. And then it's like, Oh, I guess I'll just crack open a beer or I guess I'll just take a nap, Mm. you know, or whatever I decide to do that day. And it's not that I'm not disciplined. It's just that when you have that much time on your hands, you can only, there's only so much creative capital. You can only make stuff for so long before you're tapped out. Right. Mm-hmm, yeah. and that's at least you front load it yeah true yeah yeah, yeah. well I'm more i'm teacher so i'm up by five or six i, I, I tell myself i'm gonna back load it then i never get to it yeah. <laughs> yeah no i'm a morning person by by three o'clock by two or three is something i've learned recently about myself is by two or three o'clock like i'm used to because i've always been a teacher so that's when the school day usually ends about three or three thirty mm-hmm. i'm usually like all right day's done you know, and so that's one of the great things about the podcast is that I, I usually have to book around now. So that way I'm like, okay, I have other things to do. I have other things to work on, you know, that kind of thing. But typically, man, by 11 o'clock, if you give me a, a, a month off, dude, I'm going to, I'll get all kinds of shit done by, by noon. We were talking about how euphorophobia is kind of, it's pretty heavy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And but I've been you told also... it's challenging to listen to because it's like, oh, I can't listen to Take Me Two anymore. I always skip that one. It's a good song, but I just can't listen to it. I've heard yeah, that. well, like you said, all all those last three. I mean, I'm coming home if you let if you let me really hits me. Um, and it's hard to listen to, but it's beautiful. Um so but then you also said you have a bunch of like sillier songs and 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 that kind of thing. How much of your personality do you think is like heavy how much of it do you think is like lighthearted and silly because i feel like i've gotten to see just in this like 35 minutes or so a little bit of both seems like almost 50 50 so far from what i've experienced and i'm curious if you have any sense of that for you well yeah i think it's probably 50 50 when i'm when i'm when i'm happy i i there's a there's always a tinge of sadness or or self-deprecation to it and when i'm sad there's always a hint of like humor or vulgarity to it i mean there's always kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing even in the sad songs i feel like there's always like a hidden joke or something uh it's easier for me to write a sad song than it is a happy song Mm. but i almost enjoy playing the happy ones more um you know kind of lighthearted like the i have this the next one that's going to come out the next uh one i'm going to make it's like more like John Prine influenced, you know, kind of like uh, there's always I love him because there's always like this 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 wink of his eye and everything he's singing, you know. Yeah. Uh, so he's a big inspiration. But uh, uh, yeah, I'd probably say 50 50. OK. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because to think about like from a writing perspective, for me, at least it's easier for me to write. I've only recently written love songs. Like I, I wrote three love songs for the the woman I mentioned at the whirlwind romance, but even in 10 years, I think I wrote one love song and the other, uh, in the other situation, it wasn't anything to do with the two women. It was just something about my headspace and like how I'm, I'm more comfortable writing about the heavy stuff. I'm more comfortable writing about the difficult things than I am the happy things. And I, I'm interested. 100%. If, yeah, That's... you agree? Okay. I, and they hate it. So I'm in a relationship. I'm in a relationship right now. With someone I've known for six years. He always had a boyfriend. I always had a girlfriend. Finally, we were both single, and it's work. It's working really well. And Good. you know, sh- she wants her song, right? <laughs> of course. But I'm like, I don't write when I'm happy. You know, I can't. You know, like, do something shitty to me and break up with me out of nowhere. Then you'll get like ten. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I write you three albums. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want your concept record, baby? All right. Go, go, <laughs> go fuck someone else. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. All right, this thing's about to end on us since we, we are DIY around here and don't pay for uh, Zoom. Can we start? The, can we click the same yeah, link yeah. and do a few more minutes? All right, cool. Thanks. Cool. All right. Cool, we're back. Sweet. Um. Okay, this has been a, such a pleasure, man. And I just I don't want to take too much more of your time, but we usually end on the art that has you fired up at the moment, which could lead us down quite the uh, rabbit hole. Um, 
Mm. What like what have you been listening to or watching or reading? Seem like a fellow who reads quite a bit. Yeah, I do read quite a bit. As far as music, I like the idea of be, of being hyper local, and I have like like you, I have so many songwriter friends. Yeah, and I, I and I and I'm usually a champion of my friends' songs, especially when they're good. You know, I I, I know all the words to their songs. Um, I and I, I guess the two people friends of mine who I really admire and respect would be Sean Keel who just won the Kerrville Folk Festival oh, cool. and, uh, and, and Jack Henry or Jack Corcoran Michael Corcoran's boy we just had his dad's memorial but Jack is 29 and he's an incredible songwriter he's got like this Leonard Cohen bent to him lyrically cool. and he's, he's, he's got the whole he's the whole package man I hope, I hope uh, he starts getting some traction and then Sean Keel, who's, who's just a master lyricist and, and master of imagery. Uh, so, yeah, I kind of lately, you know, I always go back to my heroes. I'm always listening to Prine, Roger Miller, Christopherson, whatever. Um, but I, I love listening to, to my friends and to local people mostly. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, we, you know, I mean, here in Orlando, I, I try to, I try to mention this as often as I can on the show that like we actually have a really deep well of singer songwriter kind of folks here. There's a lot of really great music being made in Orlando and there's some really talented people who, you know, who honestly there's a handful of them who I feel like your friends did telling you to make your damn record right or like mm -hmm. there's so many of my friends i've got others that are hustling all the time and making records and doing all kinds of stuff but i got a couple of folks that i'm just like buddy you are so good and there's no reason why people shouldn't be hearing these songs so you know thank you for finally listening to your friends and getting out there and getting overcoming that psychological barrier and making this record because it's reaching people and it matters and it's been helping me man it's been helping me and i'm really grateful for it uh, that's uh, that makes me so happy that's that's i w i always appreciate when someone listens intently and they get what i'm trying to do and that it, they're also there it's a sad record but it's meant to be therapeutic you know so I'm I'm glad that it's actually helpful, and it, my my fear was that it's just going to bring people down. So you know, like, but there, there's you know, there's happiness and the sadness, you know. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm glad that it had that has that effect. Dude, thank you. This has been such a pleasure. But uh, man, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Have a great rest of your day, man. Great to meet you, man. I hope to see you again in the future shortly. Likewise, yeah. I'd love for if you do get out there and play those songs, I'd love for you to, for you to make it down here to Florida and actually get to see them live. I like the suggestion. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm almost smart with this patchwork quilt of the heart as it gains another time. Chris Robeson, y'all. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank all of you for listening. ChrisRobeson.com for all things Chris Robeson. The song you're hearing in this episode is Held You from the, his record, Euphoraphobia, which we talked about during the conversation and I just have connected with on such a deep level. MarinadePodcast.com for all things The Marinade. Follow us on all the things. Subscribe and give us a five-star rating on your podcast app. Tell a friend about the show. These are all free ways to support The Marinade. Go do that right now while you're listening, please. It makes a big difference for us and costs so little of your time and energy. Also, please follow Life's Greatest Hits on Instagram so you can get updates about my new podcast with my dear friend Jordan Foley. I am so happy to announce that the first episode is available wherever you consume podcasts. Make sure to subscribe to that on your podcast app so you don't miss a thing. We are working hard to expand this marinade media thing and bring you more stories. Episode two, we're going to record uh, this coming weekend, and I can't wait for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you for listening. If you really like what we're doing, consider joining our Patreon community. Just two bucks a month, y'all. You can gain access to Patreon exclusive content like our show Jason's Journey, where I talk about the moments that shape my creative life and provide a window into the process of making the marinade. One of the best days of the month for me is recording what we're getting down on with my dear friend, the brilliant and hilarious Peter Haroldson. That's about the art that has us fired up at the moment. Y'all, you can try a free trial of Patreon to see if you like it. No pressure. 
Try it for seven days. Set a reminder on your phone in case you want to cancel. Keep going if you dig it. It's only two bucks a month. If you want to support the show financially, but you don't want to commit to a monthly subscription, I totally get that. You can Venmo or PayPal us. It's just at the marinade and all the money goes right back into the making of the show. My trip to Kentucky and Tennessee and Georgia this year um, on my Grounded Summer Tour where I covered Laurel Cove Festival. I covered Bonnaroo. That happens because of the generosity of our listeners. But above all, we're just so thankful that you listen and spread the word about the marinade. Until next time, go out and create something. Cheers, y'all.